told him as far as See who shows up. Nobody wants to show up. I know. Yeah. So nothing picked up. Let us worship the Father. Worship the Father. Worship the Father of glory. Let us worship the Father. Worship the Father. Worship the Father. And we will glorify. We will glorify the Lord. Father, praise to the Father, praise to the Father of glory. Sing your praise to the Father, praise to the Father, praise to the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. Lift your hands. Father, hands to the Father, hands to the Father of glory. Lift your hands to the Father, hands to the Father, hands to the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of glory. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of love. Good morning and welcome to Mountainside. It's so good to see all of you here. We're a little bit sparse, but uh, we're so thankful for all of you that are here with us this morning. Uh, we know that... Uh, Regardless of whatever craziness is going on out in the world, God is still in control. God is still providing for us, and, and uh, God has seen the end. So uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, if you are a visitor here with us, we would like you to uh, make a record of your attendance by filling out one of these little yellow cards and uh, leave it in the collection plate for us. Uh, and uh, please uh, stay behind to meet with us uh, at the end of the service today. We're going to continue our worship at this time with a reading from Psalm number 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Let's stand as we sing this morning. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I Lord among the nations, I will sing of you among the peoples, for great is your love, reaching to the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the sky. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be all 
altar of the earth. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples, for great is your love. Reaching to the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the sky. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. You are beautiful beyond description, to marvel, to wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and I'm so thankful for um, a beautiful day outside. Lord, your sunshine is proving now more than ever how much of a blessing it is for us and for our health and our well-being. And Lord, I thank you so much for that outside today, Lord. Lord, we are living in a very strange time, um, and People are all over the board in terms of feeling very chaotic and then very carefree, Lord. And, and so I pray today that you place on our hearts peace, Lord. I pray that we recognize that we are humans and we are not flawless and we do not have some great power. Um, to save ourselves or or anything else, but that we do serve a mighty God whose power is endless. And so I pray that we put our trust in you and we put our trust in your power, not just in this circumstance, Lord, because I know in just a few short months that, um, that it'll be something different. Um, but I pray that we take this time now where we seem to have more time than we normally have because of all the cancellations of things, Lord, that I pray that we uh, take this time to reflect on that and immerse ourselves in that and and recommit ourselves to that if we need to do that. I know, Lord, that, uh, that my life is a lot less busy than it was just a few short weeks ago. And so I pray that I use my free time to be in your word. Lord, I pray that we all do that. I pray that we uh, we'll be talking to you more than we ever have. And I pray that we will build good habits that we can take into the busier times in life, Lord. Lord, 
above all things, I just pray that we will tr truly trust you and really truly trust the power that you have. Lord, I pray that we recognize that that power comes from you and that you have the power to do um, anything at any time, at any place. Lord, I pray and I ask that you help us in this time to achieve balance, that we do trust in you, but we also uh, act responsibly and, and act with care and act with love, um, that, we, that we take care of others. Lord, I do pray a special, uh, a special blanket of protection over those people who are vulnerable right now physically, Lord. Lord, but I don't want to lose sight of the people who uh, are struggling emotionally, that are struggling spiritually, that are struggling maybe even mentally with battling with things, Lord. And I pray for those people as well, that you encourage them, that you lift them up, and that you use each and every one of us how you see fit to be an encouragement to those people, Lord. Lord, I pray for um, the families who have recently lost loved ones, that you encourage them and strengthen them and bless them in this time. Lord, and I pray that you, um, that you be with those who are maybe having any relationship um, strife at all, whether it be in a marriage, whether it be parents raising children, whether it be a brother and sister or a brother and brother or a sister and sister or whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you help mend those relationships back, Lord. I pray for this church body, Lord, that we can continue to fellowship and encourage each other and love each other, Lord, and take care of each other, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus because we know no matter what happens in this life, good or bad, that we are given that, that blessing of eternal life because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, the conquering of death that Jesus made, Lord. So we thank you for Jesus, and we ask all this in his name. Amen. From Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Let's, let's sing praises to God our King. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor, and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It frees in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the Beautiful 
day spent in the house of the Lord is better than lifetimes spent in the dark in kingdoms of shadow and night. For the Lord is a sun and a shield, my hope and my song in the night. How beautiful, how beautiful are your dwelling places, O Lord. Blessed is the man, how blessed is the man whose confidence is in you. His hope will sustain him, he will endure, and he will be kept from the fire. For the Lord is a sun and a shield, my hope and my song in the night. From Isaiah 53, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. We're going to sing this next song in preparation for the Lord's Supper. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have we lost away. Oh, we hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we pray. You are the one we adore.
distribute the plates that we have broken the bread and put it in small individual packets. So when you receive your tray, simply take a packet, and pass the tray on, and then take of your own bread. Thank you. Shall we go to God in prayer? Father God, we thank you so much for the blessings you give us each and every day, but more so the blessing of your son that was pierced for our transgressions so that we might be saved. We know that this bread that represents his body we take in remembrance of him. Let us do that in a way that is pleasing to you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this cup. We thank you for the fruit of the vine. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that he was willing to shed on our behalf that washes us clean and lets us stand before you righteous. We take this cup to remind ourselves of the cost of that salvation, this gift that you offer, but that you ultimately paid for. Lord, we are humbled before you. We thank you. We are privileged to worship a God as loving and merciful as you. So we do this to remind ourselves how loving and merciful you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Oh, the song after the sermon this morning will be number 853. Uh, there will be no children's Bible hour this morning. Um, let's uh, stand as we sing, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he. because Rick is in Phoenix. <clears throat> when Rick asked me to preach, he was, he's told me that he was going to go to Phoenix to see his grandsons. I said, and Kendra? <laughs> he acknowledged that, yeah, he'd probably say hi to her too. I'm glad you're here today. I want to begin with a question. <clears throat> Who's the highest paid judge in the United States? Federal district judges, they make $208,000 a year. Supreme Court justices, $255,000, $300 per year. Justice of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, $267,000 per year. That's a lot of money. Highest paid judge in America is Judge Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Judy makes $47 million a year. Chief Justice Roberts would have to sit on the bench for 176 years to earn $47 million. That's Judge Judy. Judge Judy is, uh, is, is in fact a lawyer. She was trained in law, a real judge. From 1982 to 1996, she worked in the, uh, the, in the New York justice system as a judge. But in 1996, she started the show, Judge Judy, and it is incredibly popular. Someone asked her, why is, why is this show so popular? 
And she says she thought that, that her show represented what many Americans think our justice system ought to be. Some of the things she said, she has a strong sense of what is right and wrong. And she's not afraid to rely on that moral compass as she judges her cases. If you've ever watched the show, you know that sometimes somebody will say something and she'll know it's wrong and she'll call them on it. That's wrong. <laughs> you lied. You're trying to pull the wool over. She'll just jump right in there and get involved in the case. And that's what Americans like to see. Her word is final. Her rulings are, are never questioned by lawyers. There's a reason for that. There are no lawyers there. It's just the, the plaintiff, the defendant, and the judge. And once she makes a, a, a ruling, there is no appeal to a higher court. It's over. It's done. Okay, why do we start there? We know that God is the ultimate judge. Okay, certainly we do not want to insult God by comparing him to either Chief Justice Roberts or Judge Judy. He is more a Judge Judy type judge than a Chief Justice Roberts type judge. Psalm 50 verse 6, the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. And as judge, he does not have to be persuaded by lawyers to know what is right and wrong. He has, he has this standard and it's not a standard to which he adheres. God is the standard of right and wrong. And so he knows what's going on. He doesn't need some lawyer to tell him this is right, that is wrong. There is going to be no arguing with the way he tries the cases before him. There will be no lawyers there when, when God judges. There will be no appeal to what he decides because God is the ultimate judge. Okay, today I want to look at Psalm 50 where God himself is judge. This is a psalm of Asaph. Asaph was... Uh, uh, a temple uh, was in the temple choir, and as if we read the scriptures correctly, he led the temple choir. So he's a singer, he's a musician, and he wrote this song. He begins <clears throat> by talking about the coming God. Starts out regally. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God does not keep silent. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Do you sense the, the regal entrance of God into this courtroom? He calls heaven and earth. He calls heaven and earth to kind of be bailiff. Go get my people. Because we are going to have a trial. I have no doubt that when the people heard that, hey, there's going to be a trial, God's going to be the judge, that they were excited. Because they knew that they were God's people, chosen through, through Abraham. And now God is going to come together and he's going to wreak his vengeance on those who do not like them. On those who are their enemies. Yeah, God, let's get our enemies. But they come together for the trial. Hear, O oh my people, and I will speak. O oh Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. So rather than being witnesses in the trial against the evil ones who live outside their borders, suddenly they find themselves defendants in God's court. And the whole atmosphere changes. Paul, he goes on. God says, not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. The people were not judged because they had ignored the rituals of their faith. They continued to sacrifice just as the law demanded they sacrifice. They did what they were supposed to do. And so God says, I'm not going to judge you because you failed in these ritual requirements. You didn't. Uh, <clears throat> the people were judged because they had turned from God. You see, they had turned from God in the sense that, first of all, they had, had, had lost the meaning of sacrifice. Look at what God says. Uh, he says, not for sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continual before me. But then he says, I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. 
I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? What on earth? The people were keeping the rituals, but they had lost the purpose. They were coming to God in the, initially by simply saying, we're going to give God a gift. God, I am going to give you a gift of, of my, my bull. I'm going to sacrifice him for you. God, aren't you pleased with my generosity? And God said, I don't need a gift. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. I don't need one more. There were others who, who had an even lower view of God, who felt like somehow it's not just a gift, but it's a gift that God needs. God has to have these things in order to, to continue to be God, in order to survive. He said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. But he said, I'm not hungry. Everything here is mine already. I don't need your gifts to be God. They had lost the purpose of sacrifice. Not only had they lost the purpose of sacrifice, but they had turned from God because they had this low view of him. Uh, <clears throat> verse 16. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? You hate discipline. You cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him. You keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free reign for evil. Your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I've been silent. And you thought that I was one like you. But now I rebuke you and lay this charge before you. People had turned from God. They, they, they were doing evil. They, they were being slanderous to one another. They were unconcerned with one another. They were oblivious to sin, tolerant of sin. And they felt like everything was fine because God hadn't done anything about it yet. God said, no, I am going to rebuke you. But he did come with a word to his people. One, <clears throat> do not rely on yourselves. That, that's almost kind of reading between the lines. But here are a people who are self-sufficient, self-satisfied, believing that they have this special relationship with God and they approach each other as equals, that, that they need God as much as God needs them. And God, in essence, is saying no. Then he says, turn to God. Verses 14 and 15. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Rather than giving to God because you're giving him a gift or because you think he has a need, offer God sacrifices out of a heart of gratitude. A heart that recognizes God is good and he's given me much. That's the attitude to come to God. Offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Perform your vows to God. The, the vow that was utmost in the lives of the Israelites was the one made in Exodus 19. God had taken the people to, to Sinai. Moses came down from the mountain, said, here's the deal. God will be your God if you will be his people. Yeah, we'll do that. We want God to be our God. So yeah, we'll be his people. That was the initial covenant that they made with God. We will be your people. Perform your vows to God. Do what you said you were going to do. Then trust God for your deliverance, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Don't rely on yourselves and your own intellect and your own power and your own military and your whatever. Look to me for that support. Asaph ended the psalm with this encouragement. <clears throat> the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Look to me, live for me, recognize me, and you will be saved. Okay, what does this psalm have to say to us? How do we approach God the Most High? 
First of all, we know that judgment will come. It's inevitable. Hebrews 9, 27. After death comes judgment. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 12. The dead will be raised and judged. Yeah, judgment is inevitable for us. And the judge will be the Lord himself. Psalm 9, 7 and 8 says that the Lord judges with righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We know that we're going to be judged, and we're going to stand before God in that judgment. So, <clears throat> how do we approach the judge? We must not try to appease God. <clears throat> That's what the, the Jews were trying to do. They were trying to appease God by giving him these, these lovely sacrifices. No, we, we cannot appease God. We cannot appease God with our worship. <clears throat> now, does God call us to worship? <laughs> Absolutely. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 20, 29. Jesus was visiting with the woman at the well. And he said, God seeks people to worship him who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah, we need to worship. It's good to be here today to worship God. But can we approach God and say, because we have worshiped, Therefore, we have done all that is required, that we are now acceptable in your sight. No, that's not the purpose of worship. God does not need our worship, okay? God is going to be God whether we worship or not. There's not something lacking in God that is filled up because we worship. Remember when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that last Sunday? And the people were shouting, Hosanna, glory be to God in the highest. And some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Rabbi, control your followers. They're approaching blasphemy. And Jesus said, hey, if my followers did not praise me, the rocks would cry out. God doesn't need our worship. God is who he is. I was, I was tickled <clears throat> uh, about a week ago. Things change a lot in a week. But a week ago, the NBA was talking about playing games in empty stadiums. And LeBron James said, I will not play in an empty stadium. <laughs> you see, LeBron needs the <coughs> cheers. He needs the crowd to be who he is. God does not need the crowd to be who God is. He is God. He is full. He is complete. He does not need us. But he wants us. Okay? So... We, we can't appease God with our worship. We can't appease God with our righteousness. Now again, does God want us to be righteous? <laughs> Absolutely. You should be holy as he is holy. Again and again and again. The, the scriptures talk to us about obeying God, being godly, loving one another. All these things that contribute to our righteousness, our godliness. These are things we are called to do. But are these things that we are called to do uh, an appeasement of God. There's a very interesting verse in Isaiah where Isaiah says, all of our righteous acts before God are as filthy rags. Okay? <clears throat> if we take the, the most righteous thing we have, it is to God as a filthy rag. <clears throat> Valerie, if Robert were, were caught by a patrolman going too fast. I know Robert would never speed, but if he were <clears throat> and he had to appear before the judge and you decided that what the judge needed was a bribe to, to really get his attention. So you send one of your daughters dirty diapers. <laughs> you think that's going to make a lot of difference? That's kind of the point that Isaiah was making. Don't think of just dirty rag. Think of Nauseating, dirty rag. All of our righteous acts before God are as dirty rags, dirty diapers. No, we must not try to appease God. We approach God by acknowledging our deed for Him. Psalm 116, O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. You see, we approach God humbly. We're, we're, we approach God thankfully. In our thanksgiving, we recognize that all we have is from Him. 
Every good and perfect gift is from above, from God, in whom there is no change due to turning. Every good gift we have is from God. Okay, to what degree then can I be self-sufficient if I recognize that I have nothing that has not come to me from God? Years ago, there was a fellow that I visited with off and on for you know, close to a year, I guess. And he was angry at God. <clears throat> and he kept telling me he didn't need God at all because he was a self-made man. He had gone to school and he had learned a trade and he was taking care of himself. I don't need God. And I said, well, <laughs> you spent how many years in school? Well, four. How healthy were you when you were in school? How did you manage to learn the information that was presented to you at school? Did you create your own brain? Everything we have is from God. There's no way that we can stand up pridefully and say, Okay, God, I've thanked you for what I think is appropriate. The rest of it's on me, and so we're good to go. We're, e we're even now. I thank you for what you've given me. I've done what I am thankful for. Be humbly thankful, recognizing that everything comes from God. Be submissive. Be willing to follow. Be willing to do what is called. The, in, in, the, in the psalm, it said, perform your vows. What vow did you make to God? Hmm, thought about that? When we were converted... We made a confession. Jesus is Lord. Okay, what does Lord mean? Lord means master, ruler, sovereign. At what point can we say to God, I have obeyed you enough, now the rest of the week is mine? We can't. We can't say that to a sovereign Lord. We humbly come before God and say, we are your servants. And like the story Jesus told, when we've done all that is asked of you, ask of us, we still say we are unworthy servants. Humbly come before God. Be submissive. Be trusting. <clears throat> Recognize that, that your life is in the hand of God. I started planning this lesson long before the coronavirus got so out of hand, but there are, there, there's so much fear now. It's a serious issue. It's something we need to take seriously, something we need to, to do our best to avoid, but we must never become hopeless and begin to believe that somehow God has lost control of the world because he has not. Trust God. He will care for you. He will lead you. He will bring you to that salvation. What he's saying basically is this. I don't want your appeasement. I want you. I want you to give yourself wholly and unreservedly to me. And if you'll do that, then we're good. We know judgment will come. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Let's sing Psalm 50. This is the tune of uh, How Sweet, How Heavenly. Hear, O my people, I will speak. O Israel, hear this word. My witness now against you all, for I am God the Lord. I do not judge your offerings always before my face. I claim no bull path from your stalls, nor he goats from their place. For all the forest beasts are mine, the herds are in my sight. I know the creatures of the field and every dirt in fly. Offer to God a 
sacrifice, keep your vows carefully. In trouble call and I will say that you shall honor me. If you need to surrender to Jesus today, and give your life to God. Come to the front while we stand and sing. <clears throat> Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all Heavenly Father, again, we come before you thanking you so much for the blessing you give us on a daily basis, Father. And Father, as we uh, thank you for what you do provide for us, and as we share that gift back with others, uh, we ask that we give with an open heart. We thank you again, Lord, for again your sacrifice of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Mountainside. It's a pleasure to see everyone here today. We do thank you for being with us today, especially with the, uh, the, the news, of course, of the coronavirus that's going on. We encourage everyone to please pick up a bulletin. There's a lot of news. Uh, our condolences go out to a couple of families, the, the Darnells, the Keefs have had recent losses. There's a lot of ill people in our bulletin that we ask you to, to pray for as well. Zarita, there are uh, many others, so please pick up a bulletin. Uh, another announcement, um, uh, Ted and Flo Davidson from the first service, they ask us to pray for their granddaughter, Kristen Ung. She is scheduled to leave Aberdeen, Scotland early Wednesday morning for home due to the coronavirus. Uh, she is going to be flying, of course, overseas, or as I like to call them, she'll be on a tube of infection on the way back to the United States. So hopefully they ask, of course, that, uh, that we pray for a safe trip home and without having to go right into quarantine when she gets here. Um, 
If everything goes well, she should get in around midnight on Wednesday morning. On the inside page of the bulletin where Rick's message usually is, is a letter that the elders sent out to our list serve via email. Uh, we encourage everyone to pick up a bulletin and read that. I'll, of course, uh, hit the highlights again. We as an eldership, not only are we concerned with your spiritual well-being, but we're also deeply concerned, of course, about your physical well-being. As such, we've taken a number of precautions to try to uh, uh, ensure our members stay as healthy as possible. We're going to temporarily stop serving Wednesday night meals. We've ceased children's Bible hour temporarily as well. Uh, you've seen some changes that we've made to the way we partake of the Lord's Supper. Hopefully this week we will get in individual communion cups as well. So we hope to, uh, further, to make further progress on that sort of thing. We're doing our best to ensure a supply of hand sanitizer and Kleenex around the building for use. Some of this is going to be out of our control, of course, because hand sanitizer is getting very hard to find, but we will do what we can to try to ensure the, uh, the members' safety here uh, of our brothers and sisters. Of course, as, uh, as our brothers and sisters, you have, uh, you have some things that you can do as well. We ask that if you're not feeling well, please stay home. Um, be considerate of those in our congregation that may be suffering from immune problems or other respiratory infections, those types of uh, people that are suffering from lung deficiencies and things. Please be considerate of them. And most of all, uh, you know, do what you think you need to do to keep your family safe because we do want everyone to be, uh, to be as safe as possible. On that note, uh, we are trying to walk a fine line. We don't want to be... We don't want to be seen as having a lackadaisical attitude, but we also don't want to be hysterical. Most of all, I want to say that God is in control of this. We live in a fallen world. This is one of the things that we have to face. There are diseases, there are bad things that happen, but ultimately, no matter what happens to us, God is in control and we have the hope of salvation with Jesus at the end of all of this. Uh, in First Peter, of course, it reads, cast your cares on you. A number of times throughout the Bible, we're encouraged to be strong and courageous. President Trump has declared today a day of national prayer for the coronavirus. We Christians tend to call this Sunday another national day of prayer. But I do ask you all to be mindful of the crisis in our country. We have an opportunity as Christians to be courageous. It does not mean we're any more or less vulnerable to the dangers that we face in our society, but we do have a hope that the world needs to see. I encourage everyone to live in every interaction that they have and be an encouragement to those around us. If they ask why we might be less concerned, it's an opportunity for us to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And I would encourage everybody to keep that in mind and just try to be calm, try to be sane, and try to encourage those that are in a real panicked state about this because God is in control. And on that note, let's go to the Father in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much that we have this opportunity of prayer. Father, we live in very uncertain times and very scary times, as Chad mentioned. Father, I pray that you give us the courage to live our hope, Father, our very real hope in your Son. It is through his, through his death, through his resurrection, that we have our hope of eternity with you. Father, I pray that you, uh, that you help us to be models in our world. Father, help us to model Christian behavior to those that we come into contact with. Father, most of all, thank you for loving us. We do know that you're in control, Father, and we love you, and we thank you for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Julia.